When the Legends Die, Chapter 47. He stayed at the old campsite the first night, but even with the sheep gone, their smell persisted. He had been so used to it all summer that he hadn't noticed, but now it seemed to taint the air. Sitting by his fire that evening, smelling the light breeze that came to him over the old bed ground, he had the wry thought that a good many things were like the sheep. You got free of them, or thought you did, but the smell of them kept coming back. Well, he told himself, that's why he was here. He had got rid of those memory smells, all but one, and he had come back to get rid of it. He had put off his return to the arena for a week or two just to get this done, to wipe the slate clean. He was going to run that bear down, and if it was a grizzly, he was going to kill it. He drank the last, of co last cup of coffee, ignored the sheep smell, rolled up in his blanket, and slept soundly. But the sheep smell was still strong on the damp air the next morning, so after a quick breakfast, he packed his gear and moved to the little meadow. He had seen a seep spring there a few days ago, enough water for a one-man camp. He went there, slung his pack in a tree, safe from the prowlers, and set out with only his belt knife and his rifle. He climbed the old trail through the tongue of brush to the little opening where he had seen the bear tracks and began to range the mountainside. The trail was cold, and the mountainside was a maze of rocky ledges and talus slopes with a scattering of scrub oak and twisted pine. He climbed, and he looked, and half a mile farther on, he found the remains of the lamb, two hooves, a scattering of splintered bones, several patches of skin that had been gnawed by mice and pecked by magpies. He went on, circling, and in early afternoon, he found a big pine with claw marks. The gouges were high on the trunk, as high as he could reach, but that proved nothing. A rock that had been at the foot of the tree had been rolled aside, probably for the bear to get at the ants and grubs beneath it. The bear could have stood on the rock and put its claw marks on the tree before it heaved the rock aside. He completed his circle, came back to where he started. He hadn't found another sign, hadn't seen one clear track. It was late afternoon. He went down to the seep spring, made camp. As he ate supper, he tried to figure it. If it had been a big cinnamon, it should have left more signs. A cinnamon is just a black bear in a cinnamon color phase. All bears are wanderers, but the blacks and the cinnamons keep to a smaller range than grizzlies, especially if they have a convenient source of food. An old grizzly will travel 10 miles overnight, stop for a light meal, then go on another 10 miles or more. A cinnamon will eat, sleep, then go back to where it got the first meal. If this had been a cinnamon, Tom reasoned, it would have come back for another lamb. At least it would have stayed around for a few days, hopeful. If it was a grizzly, it probably would travel until it made a big kill such as a deer. Then it would eat, hide its kill, sleep, then gorge again before moving on. It didn't add up either way. Tom had kept telling himself he had seen a grizzly, but he had only two brief looks, first when the bear killed the lamb, then when it turned and threatened to charge him at the little clearing. He had been so excited that he followed it into the brush unarmed. Could he believe his own eyes? He had found that one track, but couldn't he have exaggerated its size? Woodward said, and his men agreed, that the last grizzly had been killed four years ago. Woodward could be wrong, of course. There might still be a grizzly around, a wise old bear that had outwitted them all. But the chances that it was the cub Tom had known were less than one in a hundred. A grizzly cub doesn't reach full growth till it is six or seven years old, and there would be hazards all along the way, special hazards for a cub that had once been a pet. Some grizzlies live to be 30, maybe even more, but even if that cub lived to grow up, its chances of survival this long were slim, with persistent hunters and bear-hating ranchmen. All the odds said that the bear Tom saw kill a lamb was a big cinnamon but he had come back to run that bear down, identify it if possible, and put an end to that last nagging hurt. This hunt had only begun. He finished his meal, cleaned his utensils, and slept. The next morning, he went halfway up the mountainside, made a big circle. Late in the day, down near the river, not far from the forks, he found a patch of pines that had been taken down a few years before by a rock slide. Poking around in the tangle, he found where a bear had rolled two rotting logs aside to get at the beetles, then had dug out a den of marmots or chipmunks. It must have been a big bear to have moved those big logs. 
It had been there several days before, and the tracks it had left were all smudged. He went up West Fork a little way and found a rotten stump that had been ripped apart, more of the bear's work, but again there were no recognizable tracks. By all the signs, the bear was going northwest, away from Horse Mountain, where he had left his gear. He was two hours from his camp, and as he worked his way wearily back up Horse Mountain, he decided if he didn't want to spend half his time coming and going, he'd better move. Then he thought that if he was going he was doing this the old way, he would forget about camp, just take his rifle and his knife and maybe a small packet of food and stay with the trail till he caught up with the bear, sleeping wherever night found him. And, he thought with a bitter laugh, sing the bear chant. That's why he had come back, he told himself, to be free of such things, to kill those memories, the last remnant of the past. The next morning, he packed his gear and took it down to the forks, went up West Fork a little way and set up a new camp beside the stream. That afternoon, he worked on up the creek and found where the bear had dug quamash, camas roots, in a grassy, grassy opening. It had ripped up quite an area, flinging big chunks of sod aside, tearing them apart to get at the quamash in them. It had only been there only two days ago, three at most. He spent two more days working the lower end of the West Fork, but all he found was another place upstream where the bear had dug quamash. The second afternoon, a chill wind blew up and the sky clouded over, and when the rain began that evening, he remembered several signs of bad weather coming that he had ignored. The rain was cold, probably was falling as snow on the peaks. From the look of things, it w could continue all night, perhaps for several days. He got soaked finding dry wood, and before he had eaten his supper, the drainage from the slope began to seep through his camp. The place he had picked was all right in dry weather, but would be miserable in the rain. He moved up the hillside to the partial shelter of a clump of spruces, rigged an inadequate roof with his small tarp, finally got a new fire going in front of it, rolled up in his damp blanket, spent a cold, uncomfortable night. He wakened to a gray, chilly, rainy day and got soaked looking for a standing dead tree with dry wood. With a fire going at last, he cooked breakfast and tried to dry his blanket, but the gusty wind whipped the fire and blew rain into his shelter. He spent a miserable day feeding the fire and trying to dry his gear, and trying to make sense of what he was doing. He had been here a week on this bear hunt, and as far as he could see, he was no closer to the bear than when he started. Why, if it was a cinnamon, didn't it stay in one place? Why, if it was a grizzly, didn't it either move out or make a big kill? There were deer around. He hadn't seen a deer, but he hadn't been looking for one. There were tracks. Thinking of deer, he was hungry for venison. For a week, he had been living on pancakes, bacon, and trout, and his bacon was almost gone. Thinking of the soggy, half-cooked pancakes he had eaten today, his mouth watered the very thought of venison. He told himself he would take a deer tomorrow if it had stopped raining butcher out a loin, and live high for the few days he would be here. One loin, that's all he needed. Then something deep inside said it wasn't right to waste meat. It wasn't even right to take meat unless you needed it. Waste meat, and what you take to use will soon begin to stink. He shook his head angrily at the thought. Superstition. Who was he anyway? A clout Indian? He felt the chill of water trickling under him and moved to a drier place and put more wood on the fire, wet wood that smoldered and smoked. No, he decided wryly, he wasn't a cloud Indian or he would have picked a better campsite when he had had the chance and seen to it that he had plenty of dry wood. And watch the weather signs instead of squatting on a creek bank with bad weather coming, like a fool on his first camping trip. All right, so you made a mistake, another mistake. His first mistake was in coming back here instead of going to Albuquerque. Why had he come back anyway? Because he saw a bear and he thought that he thought was a grizzly and got the idea he had to kill it? Why? Because he was Killer Tom Black and wanted to forget he was an Indian. That's why. He laughed at that, a snorting laugh of derision. Killer Tom Black, the Indian who was a devil killer, was just newspaper stuff, publicity. All right, so you killed a horse or two. So he had a grudge, a lot of gravel in his craw, as Doc Ferguson put it, and he took it out on the Bronx. He made a reputation, he lived up to it, gave the crowds what they wanted. 
That was all over now, over and past. He'd got that out of his system. Now he was going to go back and ride for points, for money, and wind up his career in a few more seasons with a record they would be shooting at for a long time to come.